Rebuilding a vintage open steam launch, this is part 34, making the rudder work from a remotely mounted servo. Most of the work for the mounting was done in the last episode, and here is the completed mounting screwed into the boat, and I'm currently fitting the servo to the mounting. But I don't like the way the gas pipe which feeds the main gas jet is over two of the screws that hold the servo to the mounting. So in the end I decided to move the position of this servo just slightly to clear the gas pipe. The inner part of the Bowden cable is 1.5mm in diameter and it doesn't fit into one of these metal radio control clevises. These are designed to go onto a threaded rod like this, which is a little bit smaller than 1.5mm. By checking the cable with my micrometer and then matching this to a drill, I'll be able to make a fitting that the cable will push into. When I looked through my collection of metric taps and dies, I realised I didn't have anything this small. I'm assuming it's a metric thread. So anyway, what I decided to do was re-thread the clevis using an 8BA tap, and I'm doing this very carefully. If the tap breaks, I have to buy a new tap and a new clevis. You may also notice in this clip a creative use for a barco adjustable spanner to hold the clevis whilst I'm tapping it. This is a tub of commercially available flux, and it's the sort of flux that plumbers use for soldering pipes. And by the way, for beginners, this is soft soldering, not silver soldering. And here you see the principle. I put some solder on the iron, and then I hold the iron against the work, and then I apply the rest of the solder to the work. By doing it this way, you ensure that the solder flows into the joint. In this clip you can see the principle. Not only is the solder flowing into the brass part, it's also flowing back down the cable. So this makes for a very strong connection. Soft soldering is definitely the best method for fastening Bowden cables into fittings. Silver soldering requires too much heat and it affects the Bowden cable, it untempers it and makes it brittle. I found this out the hard way by silver soldering a Bowden cable many years ago. The cable actually broke where it was silver soldered into the brass fitting. This clip shows the clevis clipped into the tiller arm and it's working very well. It's moving an equal amount in both directions. I'm pushing the Bowden cable in and out at the other end and it's moving quite freely without much friction. Here's an external shot of the rudder, and as you can see, it moves about the same in both directions. I would think the rudder is a little bit on the small side for a boat of this size, but I'm going to have to live with that, that's the way it was made. The turning circles are going to be quite large. An easy way out of this situation is just to make an extension rudder that clips onto the existing one, which can be removed for display and just used for sailing. Once I cut the inner and outer Bowden cable to the correct length, I had to solder on a fitting, in exactly the same way as I've just shown when I soldered the fitting on the other end. This fitting is just very slightly different to make it adjustable, but as you can see, once again, the solder is applied to the junction where the iron meets the work, and it flows beautifully. I actually put too much solder on this joint because I got carried away with the video, but it's a very strong connection. All I need to do now is remove the head of the bolt and get another radio control clevis, re-thread the clevis 8BA and screw the clevis with a lock nut onto the thread. And that will make the clevis at this end of the Bowden cable adjustable. It's time now to fix the Bowden cable in position in the bolt. I've got to be really careful doing this. If I get it wrong, then it's not going to work. I'm using epoxy resin. I'm not using cyanoacrylate adhesive because I need the flexibility have been able to make slight adjustments before the adhesive cures. The mahogany block which holds the Bowden cable at 90 degrees or thereabouts is the first part to be coated in epoxy resin. The block is held in place with a spring clamp and I can make the required adjustment to get the part just in the right place to operate the rudder. After this I've fixed the other two mahogany blocks underneath the decking as well. As this Bowden cable runs from just under the deck at the stern down to the servo mounting in the bottom of the boat, I also epoxied in place some suitable mountings to hold the cable in position. This piece of mahogany is the last of the mountings and it's right down in the bottom of the boat, very close to the servo. And this is a special mounting because what it needs to do is support the Bowden cable when it's out at its full length. The outer part of the Bowden cable finishes halfway down the piece of mahogany. As you can see, there's nothing there. It allows for a little bit of movement on the cable from side to side, which I wouldn't have if the cable went all the way through. What it's doing is acting as a guide for the cable, 
and this helps prevent the cable from kinking or bending. If the Bowden cable came right to the end, there wouldn't be any tolerance. As the servo arm moved the inner cable towards the outer cable, there would be some friction. As the servo is trying to describe an arc, and the Bowden cable is simply a linear device. To position this piece of mahogany very accurately in the boat, I'm using various pieces of scrap wood to hold it in position, and I'm dropping some cyanoacrylate adhesive in as well as the epoxy. This is a little bit like a spot weld before you weld the entire joint. It will hold it in position until the epoxy sets so it cannot move. By moving the servo back and forth with my large hand, which obscures the picture somewhat, but you get the principle I would think, I'm making sure that there are no jamming points. I can't actually do it yet by radio control because I haven't put the receiver or the battery or the switch in position. And it's painting time once again. I do a lot of painting on these models. All I'm doing is painting the mahogany parts to waterproof them. The mahogany looks quite pleasant unpainted, but it's a bit out of character. So I'll give it a coat of the same black paint that I used on the rest of the hull, and when it's dried, it will match in perfectly. So that's the second mounting painted. Now it's time for the third part, being careful not to miss any. And then finally, I'm painting the mounting block, which is underneath the stern decking. Some of you watching this may be thinking, why has he put all the radio control in the bow end of the boat? There are a couple of good reasons for this. One of the reasons being is that originally the boat had a small Myford milling table in the bow area just to act as ballast. I will not be using the small Myford milling table because I've put everything else in the front of the boat, the gas tank, the condenser and all the servos and the mountings. Plus the radio control battery is going to be in the front and the receiver and the switch etc. And it's still going to need more ballast than that. I'll be using some sheet lead, the type of stuff that you use on a chimney to stop the rain coming in. And the other reason for putting the radio gear in the front is I don't want to put it anywhere near the steam engine because that will kick out quite a lot of oil and water. So it's the lesser of the two evils really. By putting them in the front, there is the condenser, which will keep the area nice and warm and therefore dry. I don't think there are going to be too many episodes now before this is finished and I can move on to something else. With all the superstructure parts in place, everything fits well. It's getting very close now to the final job, which is repairing and repainting the hull. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.